Welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Oxen AI, where every week we dive into interesting research papers and try to tease out the key insights that you can apply to your own AI and machine learning projects. If you're new here, welcome. We do this live every Friday with the Oxen AI community. During the week, the team at Oxen AI is building, busy building collaboration tools for iterating on machine learning data sets. Think of it as Git plus GitHub, but for large data sets of hundreds of thousands of images, audio, video, text, CSV, parquet files, whatever you can think of, you can shove it into Oxen. Uh, we believe that quality data is the starting point for any machine learning or AI project. And these papers that we go over help us get visibility into the types of data people are using and the types of state-of-the-art models that people are building today so that we can take some of these techniques and apply them to our own work. The field of AI is moving quite fast, so we believe that slowing down on Fridays and going through these research papers in detail is the best way to stay up to date with the latest research as well as learn the fundamentals. And if we do that, we feel the better products we can all make as a group. And so this paper is called the tool former paper. It's from the team at Meta AI and this university in Barcelona that I'm not going to try to pronounce. It was released in February of last year. So it's a little older uh, than some of the papers we've been going over, but it still has a lot of great fundamental techniques that could be applied to models today. Um, so just keep that in mind when we go over the results section, they use slightly older language models, but this could be applied to any of the open source ones we have out there today. So diving in to the paper itself, um, they start by talking about how large language models have shown remarkable capabilities to solve new tasks from few examples, but paradoxically, they struggle with a lot of basic functionality such as maths, dates on a calendar, or staying up to date with information that's happening in the world, like current events. But luckily, as software engineers, we've already solved a lot of these problems with tools that we've built, such as a calculator or a calendar or a search and retrieval system. So this paper introduces a model, which they call the tool, tool former, which has been trained to use external tools outside of the model parameters itself. So the tool former decides on APIs that it wants to call, when it wants to call them, and what arguments to pass in to those API calls to better answer users' queries. So a really cool technique that they came up with here. And they start with some examples of uh, these types of questions that, that language models might struggle with just given the model parameters. And they kind of break them down into five categories. So recent events, the hallucination of exact facts. Um, so like who's the current president might be a recent event that might not be in the training data of the model. A hallucination of a fact might be like, give me five scientific papers that prove that the earth is flat and it might just generate things that look like scientific papers that don't actually exist. Uh, difficulty understanding low resource languages that aren't in the training set. So like if you have a giant web crawl, that's probably predominantly in English. So if you try to do something in, in Vietnamese, it might not be great at that, but we already have translation systems that are good at that. Um, math and performing precise calculations. So if you have word problems, like George has 10 apples and gives Sally three, and Molly gives him five, how many apples does George have? Or unawareness of the progression of time. So if we wanted to know what hot archive papers came out this month, um, basic language models wouldn't be able to do stuff like this. And I feel like if you're not deeply ingrained in the field of AI or LLMs, uh, people sometimes have a hard time understanding the differences between like, this query, because um, they're used to using Google search and stuff like that, that has access to up-to-date knowledge and what an LLM is good at uh, 
on the surface. So this kind of like combines these capabilities together in an interface that makes it transparent to the user that the language model is using a tool. Um, and if you guys were at the AI tinkerers last night, I, I showed this example, but we were diving into like what tools does chat GPT use under the hood? Um, lots of people think it's just like, oh, it uses GPT-4 because I clicked GPT-4 in the upper corner there. Uh, when in reality, sometimes when you put in a prompt, it tries to redirect it to other models that it's using. And sometimes it actually has a chain of models with tools uh, encapsulated within it. So like if I, you know, use the newest chat GPT with the image generation, and I say, generate an image of a volcano spewing out a combination of text and images, which I used for our uh, lava deep dive, you can see that under the hood, it's giving the assistant some API parameters. It's using a tool, Dolly, to generate the image. It's returning a piece of text and the image to me. And it kind of goes through this pattern of like, the assistant uses a tool to better give us the output that we wanted. Um, so that's how ChatGPT uses it. Uh, I don't know what they do under the hood, but it might be something similar to the tool former. So the tool former architecture itself, um, what's really cool is they uh, use a self-supervised data set that they create automatically um, without requiring a large amount of human annotations. And once the model is trained on this data set, it should be able to, as it's predicting the words in the sentence, decide when it needs to stop, use a tool, and then continue generating its solution. Um, so the tools that they use in this paper are fivefold. They have a question answering system. They have a Wikipedia search engine. They have a calculator, a calendar, and a machine translation system, but in theory, you could have any sets of tools. It's all just about the training data that you'll put into the system, and we'll dive into how they generate that training data next. So the approach that they use is each one of these tools that we defined above is represented by an API call. But since the model a language model is simply predicting sequences of text. They have to represent these API calls as a sequence of text. So for example, they give uh, a few sentences here that they what might want the model to generate. So they start generating word by word. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine is a registered trademark of the language model itself is going to say, I don't know much about the New England Journal of Medicine. I want to use my question answering tool with this parameter as input. I'm going to get the output of Massachusetts Medical Society from the question answering tool and then generate the MMS. Same thing goes for calculations out of 1,400 participants, 400, and then 400 or and then it has to decide, I want to use the calculator tool to divide uh, 400 by 1400 to get the percentage um, to continue generating the text. So they have five different tools in here. It's like question answering, calculator, machine translation, wiki search, um, and they also have a calendar, which they don't show in this diagram. Um, so in order to do this, they generate a massive training data set um, that looks like a lot of text sequences that looked exactly like this. And uh, it's a synthetic data technique, and it's probably the most interesting part of the paper uh, is the data itself. They actually don't change any model ar architecture. They use a model GPTJ that they got off the shelf, like open source model, um, 
And it's really the training data that went into this that makes this all work. Quick so, question real quick, Greg. Yeah, go ahead. There was a question in the chat about um, the like neural machine translation part as actually a selected tool versus is that something that kind of is already embedded in the weights of that GPTJ? Um, so. Yeah, th so that's actually a separate tool that they call out to. That's a separate neural network that's specifically trained for machine translation. Yeah. Um, so they're saying rather than just adding a bunch of new data to the pre-training data set, we already have models that can do this. Let's use them. It's like kind of like a specialist. Got it. Thanks. Yep, exactly. So back to the training data generation, they do it in three steps that are pretty straightforward to follow and we'll dive into each one of them. Um, the first one is they take an existing language modeling data set, which is just a bunch of passages of text, sentences, et cetera. They take each sentence like Pittsburgh is known as the steel city and they use a clever prompt uh, to try to figure out what API calls would help complete this sentence if you kind of like split it up into its two halves. So if the language model started with Pittsburgh is known as, they're trying to inject that API call logic right there um, so that it can complete the steel city. So that's the first step. The second step is they actually execute all these API calls because they're not guaranteed that this first step puts API calls in the right place, or even that the API calls are the API calls that we want. Um, so they go and execute all of those external tools and external code and kind of like inject it into the text. And then finally, they have a, a technique to like filter down all of the ones that weren't helpful API calls to make a, to make the final training data set that they're gonna fine tune the model off of. So we'll go into each one of these steps um, and we'll actually do some live LLM calls to like really have this uh, hammer this home. So let's take the example that they had above Pittsburgh is known as the steel city. Um, they take a giant prompt that looks like this. They have it um in the paper itself but they say your task is to add calls to a question answering api to a piece of text you can write them in this format uh that looked like a miscopy um and then they give them some end shot prompting examples of this would be an example input this would be the example output so like joe biden was born in scranton pennsylvania they want to inject they want this LLM to inject tools that would be helpful in this format. Um, and then they give a couple examples of that. Then they just stop with like input X and see what the model is going to generate. So I played with this a little on Together AI to see how this might work in practice. If you guys haven't used Together AI, it's pretty cool. You can like pick from any of these models and just run them live in your browser, similar to ChatGPT. I found this news research one worked really well. Um, so if we put in this prompt and put in a new input of uh, the Pittsburgh is known as the Steel City um, and try to see what the output will be, um, you can see that this language model augmented the text that we put in and put an API call in the format that we wanted of what is the nickname of Pittsburgh. And hopefully that goes and hits a question answering system and then gives the model context that it's the steel city. So that's the okay. first step. Yeah, go ahead. There was a, a question on how this is different, like architecturally from kind of stringing together Langchain agents and calling out to them for things like Wikipedia and math calculation. Yeah, so this is all at the like fine tuning stage. Um, so we're making a model that can generate text 
that looks like this. And then once we've generated this text, once we hit these tokens, we're going to go out and make the API calls ourselves, um, rather than like a lang chain agent. I don't think it spits out as the actual text, what tools you need to use. Um, so that example prompt was an example for the question answering tool, but they actually have a specific prompt for each tool they want to generate data for. So at the end of the paper, um, if you pull it up, they have example API calls for all of these other tools um, that they use. It's in the appendix. Oh, may I add something? Yeah, go for it. Uh, the advantage of doing this is that the model itself decides what tool to use rather than, uh, you having to know that beforehand. That's a really good point. Yep. So it's kind of encoded in the model parameters, what tool it is and which one it wants to use at what point. Really good point. Um, so this is the question answering one. They have a prompt for the calculator here where they give it a few few shot prompt examples. They have it for machine learning. They have it for Wikipedia search. They have it for calendar. So feel free to dive into any one of these um, to see how it kind of works under the hood. Um, but then what they do is they get, take a data set of random sentences or passages. They use this CCNet data set. You could, in theory, use just like any list of text that you wanted, and then they run them through each one of those prompts to try to generate augmented data that they're going to train, fine tune this model on. Um, what's interesting is if you think of just like taking random sentences and running those prompts through, obviously every sentence you grab isn't going to have an interesting question answering. A uh, type of sentence or isn't going to have a math problem in them. So they do have some heuristics to make sure each tool gets each tool prompt gets relevant text. Um, things like, does it have an equal sign? The word equal, equal to total of average of followed by a number. And they only feed those through the math prompt. So there's a little heuristics and honestly hand waving that they do in the paper. They only really tell you the heuristics for the uh, math side of things, but that's another thing to keep in mind if you were going to generate this type of data. So after they've generated a bunch of sentences uh, that have been augmented with this text, they go and execute each one of these API calls and they actually generate three variations of the augmented text. So they have the original passage without API calls. They have the passage with the API call, but without the response filled in. Um, so it would kind of look like tool and the parameters. So like QA and uh, what is the capital of whatever. Um, and then the third one is the API call and the response filled in. So it's like API tool parameters and the response. So this is the one that Foley would run uh, the code or the external tool that you have. And so they have a bunch of examples of this to kind of give you a sense of what it actually looks like in practice. Um, so they might have like the WL will open on Friday API call, calendar, return, today is Thursday, March 9th, end API call, and then they'll continue generating text. And since now the model has context to what today is, hopefully it has a better, an easier job generating the rest of the sentence. Um, and so they go through every sentence in the corpus, generate something that looks more like this, but there's a lot of times that they'll inject a tool when it's not actually helpful. So the next step is filtering out the ones that aren't actually helpful, giving them a score, and then only keeping the top N or whatever it might be with some threshold. So I think the biggest contribution of this paper is one, 
the fact that we're generating this training data set, but like the way that they compute the score uh, to be able to filter out the invalid API calls is kind of the, the bread and butter of this thing. Um, so this section does is one of those sections that looks like a lot of fancy math once you get to it in the paper, um, but is pretty simple once you break down the individual parts. Um, so they have this loss equation, or it's more of like a scoring function that they define um, that takes an input Z and then sums over the log probabilities that are given from the language model itself of each token that it's predicting um, multiplied by this weight um, that we'll dive into. And then they do this for all three of the sentences that I mentioned above. So like the original sentence or passage without the API call, the passage with the API call, but not the response filled in, and then the passage with the API call and the response filled in. That's these three equations right here. And then they compute three different L scores, or I guess two, because they take the minimum of these two. They see if the difference between the passage with the API call and the response, what's the difference between that and the passage without the API call injected? They get the score, and then they're using a threshold um, to decide whether or not we should keep that passage with the API call. Um, so if you're not familiar with like log probabilities that come out of a language model, we might have a sentence that looks like this, like during archive dives on Friday, uh, then we might want to go use a calendar tool to figure out which Friday they're talking about. Call the, call the calendar tool, put a date in here, and then continue generating February 9th, et cetera. And so they're breaking these down into like, during has a probability of this. The start of R has a probability of this. Archive is like a complex word that they might ha not have in the dictionary. So they're doing this at the token level. They split it up and they continue and they get all of these scores. And once they get to this score, or once they get to the time where they're generating the tool, they want to see how well the tool helps them generate the rest of the stuff here. So if we go to the equation above, just to like tie this all together, x of j minus one is like the first half of the sentence here. So that's this x of j uh, is like the second half. Z is uh, did we put in the tool or not? Um, and then they're summing up all of these probabilities and they put this little weight on the front, um, which they define later in the paper as um, this kind of one minus 0.2 times whatever time step you're at, so that uh, if you think of like one minus 0 0.02 times one is going to be 0 0.8, then it's going to be 0 0.6, then it's going to be 0 0.4, then it's going to be 0 0.1. And they're kind of weighting that. So it only, they're only looking at how well it helps you generate the next, I guess, five tokens in that case. Um, and they're not doing it for the entire sequence. So that's all that this little weighting is doing at the front. Um, any questions there? Because I feel like this is the hardest part to grok <laughs> of the whole paper if you're not I, super I have a question. That. Yeah, go for it. Um, I like, uh, I like, honestly, I was kind of just baffled by the chat again, so I might have missed something. Um, it's so that they're doing a per token weighting and they're increasing the weights closer to the API call substitutions yep. that they made. Yep. Um, I feel like inherently that means that like they would end up destroying the innate capability of the model before, like that there would be um, some sort of information loss. Well, so this is one of the confusing parts is this, they're calling it a loss, but it's not actually 
a loss function. It's just like a fitness score for should we keep this sentence or should we kill it from our training data? So this isn't the loss function. This is just like a filtering technique for generating the data. So how does that relate to weighting the tokens? Oh, the, because the, like, yeah. you want a lower score if the API call that they put in there didn't help you generate the correct response here. I see. So they're weighting the correct answers. Yeah. Higher. Yeah. That kind of so, seems a little bit like DPO. Um, it's more about like, you're going to generate a bunch of these sentences. Some of them are going to be good and some of them are going to be bad. And then they just have a threshold where they're killing all the bad ones. What are they doing with the bad, the bad ones? ones? Are they discarding them or are they uh, using yeah. them? No, they're not using them at all. They just remove them from the training set. I think we learned in a DPO that like, if you use both of them, it's better, right? Cause it's like you move away from the stuff you don't want and then that's a, the stuff you do. Yeah. That's a good observation is honestly, this is just for the supervised fine tuning part of DPO. But if you wanted to like add the preference part afterwards, yeah. then you could okay, so keep you, these around. You'd fine tune on the API calls that made sense. And then you would DPO tune yeah. on a, I mean, it's crazy. Cause it's like, they literally have the, uh, counter, the counter <laughs> example. That's a really good point. Out. And this paper came out in February. So I don't even think DPO was out by then, but that's like a great February, which February, February uh, last year? Last a year. year ago today, which is wild. Okay. Um, I was going to say, we're I feel in, like I saw this paper a while ago. Yeah. While we're in like API result scoring land, Brian had a question on when scoring the API API calls. Is that scored with the state of the model before or after this fine tuning step? Uh, wait, say that again. Sorry. Yeah, it says when scoring the value of the API calls, do they use the model pre or post fine tuning? Oh, um, pre fine tuning. They haven't even done the fine tuning yet. They're just like collecting the data to do the fine tuning. Yep, that's a great question. Um, and then while I was digging into this just to like help me understand the math, I also found there's a GitHub repo with the filtering function and all of this stuff built in. So if you want to go read the code, I linked directly to that, um, that function. I have, there. I have a small question. Yeah. It looks like they minimum or they took the minimum of the two uh, losses with the API call not filled out and with it filled out. I don't see why they would do, run it at all with it out uh, with it not filled out at all. Oh, this one. Right. Like. Yeah. With, with I had it, that same with, question. <laughs> with it lacking the response, how would it help at all? And if it does, is that actually a good thing? Um, it's a good question. I hadn't thought about that much. I'm wondering if it's just because they are generating the question itself. So I wonder if there's anything like they might generate a question that's just not gener generally helpful, but I guess that would be encapsulated in here too. It's a good question. I don't know. I feel like you could get away with just doing this one and this one. Yeah. This also occurred to me during your talk last night. Mm -hmm. You could put just a uh, a specialized agent or like specialized agents as their own tools and they could be much smaller models that are very specific in purpose like please reflect on this uh the like this piece of text for you know mm -hmm. 200 tokens yeah totally i think that's that's a really good point and that's almost what they do with the machine translation one is just like route to ones that um, are really specific for that task. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, once they've generated all of this augmented data and filtered it down to passages with API calls that actually help, um, they simply fine tune, uh, in this case, it was GPTJ 6 billion um, with the standard language modeling task. It's just they're predicting these um, special tokens within within the generation to go call out to an external tool. So standard language modeling, predict the next word. It's just the training data set is different. And I feel like you could train any newer model on this as well. Um, tomorrow, we're doing like a little hack house 
thing in LA where I'm going to try to generate a data set that looks like this. So if you want to join us in LA, hit me up. If you want to just join us like virtually on Discord, I'll be hacking on this tomorrow. Um, could be kind of fun. But then during the inference process, once you have this fine-tuned language model on that data set, they perform the standard decoding. Um, and then as soon as they get to the token that is like the arrow saying we need a response now. Um, so as soon as they get to this token right here, um, they go and backtrack through the text that they just generated, find the start API call token, and then parse this string to go make the API call, put the results right here, put the end API call token, and then continue generating. And that's it. So you can see like this one, it literally just copied the 1.47 uh, to the next token that it generated. Um, so that's kind of the decoding process here. Cool. So how does this work in practice? Um, they ran a bunch of different experiments. Um, they wanted to see if the model can decide for itself when and how to use any of these tools while maintaining its core language modeling abilities. Um, the biggest boost in performance was on the math benchmarks, which totally makes sense given the nature of the problems. Um, question answering and translation and other language modeling tasks seem to get better as we increase the scale of the model, but what's Super interesting here is that with the when you give it access to tools, you can have the smaller model like this GPTJ get competitive performance with a model like GPT three that had one hundred and seventy five billion parameters. Um, so they started. They have like a ton of results in in the results section here. Um, so I'll just go over kind of like the format of what these results look like. Um, and so they compare four different versions of GPTJ, just the base one, the one fine-tuned on the CCNet dataset itself without any of the augmented text. And then they train the tool former and disable the tool functionality just to see like, uh, did it learn all of the completions without using the tool? um itself and then they use the tool former with using the tool um so these are all six billion parameter models and then they compare them to opt which is like a 66 billion parameter model and gpt3 which is a 175 billion parameter model and they show that the tool former uh outperforms these much larger models on tasks like squad question answering um or these slot filling type tasks um Eric was super kind and uploaded a bunch of these data sets to Oxen. So I'll, I'll link to those afterwards if you want to go look at what these actual tasks are. Um, but for the sake of time, we'll just look at the math one because um, that does give the biggest bump in performance. Um, so you can see like OPT, these are three different math data sets. Um, some of them are like word problem type things, like the one I went over at the start. Um, and some of them are more just pure mathematical symbols, but you can see the tool former gets up to 40% accuracy on these tasks where even the larger models really struggle on them. So not perfect, but a lot better than uh, your traditional language models. They also go over some scaling laws that are pretty interesting. Um, so as well as fine tuning that GPT J 6 billion, they perform a fine tuning on the suite of GPT two models. So from 124 million all the way up to 1.6 billion. And they say that the ability to leverage tools kind of, uh, emerges around the 70 uh 775 million parameter count um and they show some of these graphs of 
the improvement as you increase the model parameter size. So this uh, dotted line is GPT-3, and then this um, blue line is the tool former. And so you can see like, as soon as we get around the 2 billion parameter mark, we actually exceed GPT-3, um, but for some of the other QA benchmarks, GPT-3 still blew, blows it out of the water. Um, any questions on the evaluation techniques there? There's a lot of other sections in the paper. You could see the other scores, but I think the math and the question answering gives you a good variety of how well it performs. There was a question that we touched on, I think very briefly earlier on how kind of ahead of time, um, how the set of tools available to the model are described and how that piece fits into the training architecture. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so they dive into that in section three here in the paper. Um, and just to give you a sense of the actual tools, they have a question answering tool um, that's based off of this paper. Um, so this is actually a RAG system um, trained on natural questions. They have a calculator um, that I think is just a simple Python function that they wrote and called. Uh, they have a Wikipedia search um, that uses the BM25 retriever as the search engine on Wikipedia. Um, they have a machine translation system that again is like another 600 million parameter language model. And then they have a calendar API uh, that can just return the current date or um, some temporal context if you give it some strings. So those are the And these are, these are kind of like, um, like this set is supplied to the model in terms of like, you have these, you have these tools to work with and, and that could be configured. Yeah. And so it would be configured through the training data that you generated yep. with these five prompts. So in theory, like GPT-4 might be trained like something like that under the hood to know when to execute Python code, for example. I'm going to stop the recording and stop the sharing, and then we can dive into more questions here. But thanks for anyone who's joining on YouTube. We're going to we're gonna jam without all of this extra network going on. See you guys. <laughs>